Right. Oh, that's quite exciting. I was working out how I was going to do this, certainly slides. Although, to be honest, as you'll see, they're largely just pretty pictures for you to have, look at. And I was going to suggest you just close your eyes and use your imagination. You can do that anyway, if you like. Right. Um, so, as you can see, my title is, um, thanks to Sarah, is linking data sets with archives. And I've added a question mark on the end of that. Um, hmm. And the picture, as we'll come to later, and the picture on the front shows the hive, which is where we are based, Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service. Big, blingy building in Worcester, very high profile. Fantastic, but that has its own issues um, with the work that we do. Within the hive, the Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service is there, but so is the Joint Library uh, of the University of Worcester and the City Council and the Customer Hub. So it's, there's a lot of different people going in there, lots of, uh, of people doing all sorts of different things. We're a public service, obviously, we're the county council, and as you know, we're delivering information and advice and commercial services. This is across the archive and archaeology sector to academics, community groups, district county planners, family historians, etc., etc., commercial archaeological organisations. So you're all familiar, it's the same kind of people that we all use. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I wanted to say that because I wanted to say that I'm talking about my personal experience, my experience of linking archaeology data to archives or not. So that's where I'm coming from. So just, this is us, this is some of us clean and some of us dirty. Um, it's um, it's a, still a moderately big organisation, more than 50% externally funded now and increasingly so. There you are, that's what we do. Um, we're two years old. All Worcestershire archives and our, um, all Worcestershire, what was the record office and what was the rec archaeology service are in one building together with all the archives for the very first time in Worcestershire's history. Um, we have the HER for the county. Um, and we work very closely with our colleagues in the city and our HER is on the same platform. Um, and we present it as one as one thing. So we've got, a, we should be in the most brilliant place to do all this work. We've got a team that's together. We've got a high profile building with all mod cons and we've got a greatly increased profile. It's fantastic opportunity. And I think that what we found is to slightly garble Dickens that this is the worst of times and the best of times. Um, and that has actually profoundly affected the way we actually are trying to integrate and the kind of things that we can actually do. So I'm going to be very un-British and just talk about money for a minute, as is the case everywhere. But I think it's important because actually it's a bit like the elephant in the room and we were all in the same position, but it profoundly affects the way we operate. I don't think you always think that at the time, but actually if you look back on it, you think, oh, actually, no, it, it really does make a difference to the kind of projects that we're doing. So we've had a massive, so the worst bit is we've had a massive reduction in county council funding. When we moved into the building, we'd already had a reduction, but we had 1.2 million. This year we've got 600,000, and in two years' time we'll have 430,000 if they don't take any more offers to run a big service in this building. So that's a bit of a challenge. On the other hand, lots of opportunities to get external funding. So, you know, I'm not moaning about this, this is the way it is, but you've got this wonderful conflict between opportunity and capacity, and I'm sure we're all in the same boat. So, um, right, so that's who we are. What do we do? Now, I love this because, of course, this is what we do. Landscape, documents, you know, that's what we do. It's all completely integrated. Um, our vision, really, I mean, that's our kind of, kind of a bit of a cheesy mission statement thing, but the vision, really, at the core of it, is about using different evidence to tell a story and how powerful that is. You know, that understanding the past is not just about archaeology or just about archives. It can be in some periods, but it's, for a large part of history, it's actually a bit of both. 
Now, we were, you know, quietly confident, I think, a couple of years ago, um, before, because before we got together as one service, we'd worked as partners closely and had started a project which is kind of the epitome of this, really, which is ongoing, it's a big project, to about tithe maps in Worcestershire. Worcestershire. So, the record office digitised all the originals. So, if they've got, they hold the originals, we have digital copies of the images, and the archaeology service, as it was, created a GIS theme where all the information from the apportionment books were added. And that's wonderful because we were doing it for archaeological purposes, but of course it can be used by family historians, it can be, it can be used by... It's a really, really powerful tool. So we thought, oh, yeah, we know all about this. No problem. Um, if only it were that easy. <laughs> now, when we first started up, I, met, I got this nice slide made where we beautifully merge a record with the archaeology... That's why I say, if only it were that easy. That took about five minutes. <laughs> but I don't, not actually sure we're there yet. Um, it's two issues which affect how we've, how we've worked on our own. Or this, I think from two years, I think we've come on a long way. But there are two big issues that strike me about how we've worked in partnership with each other within the new service and also with our external partners. And one of them is, is different cultures between archives and archaeology. We all study the past, we all got on famously, but they're very different beasts, archivists. <laughs> and I'm sure they say the same about us. Now, we've quite bonded as a team, so we're working together really well, but that different culture actually affects the data we're trying to use. The approaches to the data, so what the data actually is, and data dissemination. Um, and so how the data was collected and what it's historically used for. Just to be really simplistic, archaeological data is largely collected to interpret and inform. Archive data is collected to record and they don't interpret it. That's not what they do. It's there for people to use. And that actually is a fundamental difference to the way that... So you've got catalogues which look ostensibly similar, but actually when you try to think about them, they're different. And you, that's not... I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that, you know, you don't overlook that. Um, so we have CALM and we have the HERs. They're similar, but they aren't the same. And they're fundamentally trying to do different things. Um, the second factor, of course, is, is one that I've mentioned already, which is the present economic situation, which takes away capacity. We have, we thought we were hard pushed before. You know, <laughs> what a joke. We have absolutely no slack, and I'm sure you don't either. So therefore, our more recent successes have tended to be small scale. Um, I'll get on to that a bit more later. So we've done joint projects. We've done a lot of joint projects across our service in the kind of two-year bonding process. So that almost all archaeological projects will have a bit of archive element in them. And almost all archive projects will somehow shoehorn a bit of archaeology into them. It's not actually that difficult. And the funders quite like it. Um, the where it's really worked fantastically is learning and outreach because this is totally integrated and when we do that it's all it's just data it's just information and everybody uses it you know and that's that's worked really well um, and then we've done uh, the other kind of joining together that we've done is a bit is practical and ad hoc so it might be project related or it might just be got an opportunity, see an opportunity to do it. So that's, for instance, to use the HER to signpost into the archives. It doesn't really work the other way around because of the, the way that those databases are constructed. And as Kirsty said, it could, you know, if you get spatial data into the, into the um, archives, then, so it's not that it's impossible, it's just it's a bit tricky. But it's quite easy, as you know, just to add something to an HER that points to something. And that actually works quite well. It's a very simple part of everyday work. So, for examples of that, maps. Everybody loves maps. Archivists love maps. Archaeologists love maps. So, we digitise some of the most important ones using our internal team. They're geo-referenced within the HER, and that enables us to use them within the HER, but also to point people to the originals. 
Um, just things like quinquennial reports for churches and NADFAST reports that always went to the archives. We could never get our hands on them now. We just link to them where we're allowed to. We scan them and stick them in. And images, of course. They have huge amounts of images, of buildings of people and things like that. And where it's appropriate, you can just tackle them into, tack them into the HER. So as I said, that's very... Um, it's not very tech, is it? You know, we have got a good HER, we've got good systems, and it allows us to do that very easily. But it's not fundamentally changing the HER. So I think we've unintentionally changed our focus because of all this. It just kind of happens. Um, we've been, as I said, because I was reflecting on this, I, it suddenly occurred to me um, that we are more and more driven by the need to see a very clear product for a relatively small amount of time and money because we don't have the capacity. If it takes a good chunk of time, because let's face it, we haven't got any money left, we have to get the time we spend to get the grant to do it, how much value will the results add to what we do? to, depending on what it is, to the data we can use in planning control, to the data we can give our customers. Is it just beautifully techy, but actually doesn't deliver anything very much, in which case we aren't going to be doing it, because we can't. Not because we wouldn't want to, there's all sorts of wonderful things we'd want to do, and I think we've got much more rigorous about that, just because we have no capacity, there's no slack at all. So the other thing that's fundamentally changed as well, it, well not fundamentally changed but it's become much more important, is that we always worked with partners but now we have to work with partners because otherwise we can't survive and we have to work with a wider range of partners outside the historic environment sector, outside the heritage sector and this is something that we've just started um, and the example that I, so I've got one example of what this is that I think has worked very well. Um, and that is working with the cultural hub at the University of Birmingham. Purely accidental, a gate crashed a conference, they mentioned what they were doing, I stuck my hand up, I said, I've got a big gold shiny building, can we join in? And they said yes. It was as easy as that. So that was the first thing, to have partners who actually are up for it, you know, and that they don't go, oh, well, I'm sorry, we've nearly, we've almost put the, we've almost put the tender in, the bid in, which they had. They just went, oh, yeah, all right then, you know. Um, so that was really good. So what that is about, what that hub is about, is what they call, the University of Birmingham called the Triple Helix, which is bringing together academics, collections, such as ourselves, and business, notably small to medium media enterprises within the West Midlands for their mutual benefit and the mutual benefit is very clear i think some people call it releasing cultural capital but that's probably very old-fashioned by now but sounded good to me so i use it quite a lot it's a fantastic opportunity because they act as brokers so they bring all these people together so you meet all these film companies and digital reconstruction companies and all sorts of people doing all sorts of things and you can just chat to them, and where you see there's a mutual benefit, you can start on a small-scale project, usually. The first project we did for them was, a, was a, we did with them was a, the, it's called, um, well, we call it Touch History. Um, now, all oh, right, yeah. Now, what has been taken out at this, because it was what seemed to be what stopping was everything working, it was a very small film, actually, of people using this. So this is, this is the bit where I'm going to act out. <laughs> so the Touch History is a partnership. It's funded, it's funded by European development money, not cultural money. It's a partnership between the University of Birmingham, ourselves, Library of Birmingham, um, the uh, Birmingham Museums Trust, and Ironbridge Trust. And um, basically, we all get a big touch table which is about that big, <laughs> and six people can use it at the same time. And basically, it looks really simple. I believe it's quite complicated to create it, but you can just move things around. You've probably all seen them, and you can blow, you can make things up really big and blow them up. We have very high quality digital images, so you love that because you can go right into a map. Maps are particularly good. Photographs are particularly good. Um, so, but what was the point of this? We, we put in a small amount of money. We had £10,000 um, that we blagged from somewhere else to say that we needed it for the hive, and we put in £10,000 equivalent of staff time. 
you know, that would be hard to do now, but I would still try to find it if I could because it's been so worth it. This is the main menu. You've just got some, the pictures, it's just like a photo album. So you can bring up lots of lovely pictures and play with them. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to promote our service in the hive. It's a little taster and it, it's it's in for, it, there's a, an element of it which is informative about how if because we're dealing with a lot of people that have never used archive and archaeology before so it's about how you do it because people might be quite scared that feel uncertain as to how to do it so that's the menu screen and you can see there are other things where else can i explore worcestershire's past that was an advert for all that's actually i'm not showing that because that was an advert for all the other heritage venues in the county and how we got the money basically um so there's a map one you can see the table with maps i'm not terribly excited there's an archaeology one and it's fantastic actually as an ex-pottery person for images of ceramics because you can blow them up really big and get very excited about them if i was doing what we can change these and i actually think we need to make them more right make them more close together um sorry right so um, this is this is um, this is uh, this is actually us bringing something together. You ask a question, find out where find out where you live. Um, so that's a question that brings together uh, records and archaeology, and you have the different resources. So I'll move on to that. You can use it in all sorts of ways once you've got it. Right. Um, okay. Just to close. Um, this, as I said, it's a personal perspective. This is some conclusions I've drawn from six years working on the Hive and two years working in the Hive. You need good partners who have a strong overall vision of what they want, and then you need an eye for an opportunity, and you need to be flexible. And in local government now, as those, it, it, everything changes every six months to a year. You know, there is no, there's no, nothing stays the same. So you have to be flexible. You need good partners. You, who, who, like you, are prepared to take a calculated risk. Avoid risk-averse people, because you won't get anywhere. Seek out good partners wherever you can find them, and where you, and that's mainly it's about like-minded people. Be sure that your delivery will make an impact proportional to the time and effort uh, that you that you put into it. Small projects are good. They might not be so good for your CV, but they actually do deliver quite well. Always deliver on time. Be trustworthy. And... I think it's all about people. You have the systems, they're great, but you have to have that mutual respect, shared agendas, and that is what will enable you to deliver.